Um, it's an honor to be before you today to talk about such an extraordinary and inspiring person as Phyllis Wheatley. Thank you to Dr. Stuart Morris, to the Morris Family Center for Law and Liberty, to its director, Dr. Chris Hammonds, for arranging this year's series on women in, of the American Republic. I'd also like to thank Kaylin Charles and HBU's Black Student Union, as well as Dominique Lewis and the Sigma Theta chapter of Alpha Kappa Alpha for promoting this event in observance of Black History Month. <sighs> Phyllis Wheatley is a challenging topic, and <sighs> so I, I've read all of her works, and I've read her latest biography. Um, I've looked at her letters, and I'm not sure how it's gonna go tonight, so please bear with me. I feel the burden of just a strong desire to represent her well. Phyllis Wheatley was the first woman of African American descent, African descent, to publish a book, ever. It was a book of poetry. This was in 1773 when she was approximately 20 years old. She had become an internationally recognized poet three years earlier when in 1770 her funeral elegy for the famed evangelical preacher George Whitfield was printed in newspapers in Boston and in London. She was approximately 17 years old. Her first known poem is a four-line eulogy uh, for a prominent Bas Bostonian named Oxenbridge Thatcher Jr who died in 1655, sorry, 1765, and his wife Sarah, who died the previous year. The elegy was recently discovered written on the last page of the diary of the 18th century Congregationalist minister, Jeremy Belknap, and marked Phyllis Wheatley's first effort, 1765. At that time, Phyllis Wheatley would have been approximately 12 years old. Four years earlier, she didn't know a word of English. I say approximately because Phyllis Wheatley's birthday has been lost to history. She was a victim of the slave trade, kidnapped and brought from the west coast of Africa to America as a little girl. She was missing her front teeth when she was put up for sale in Boston in 1761, a girl of only about seven or eight years old. This is hard to talk about and I'm sure it is hard to listen to. We have accounts of the horrific conditions of enslaved Africans um, that they endured in the, during the infamous Middle Passage, so-called because it was the second of three legs in an economic exchange between Europe, Africa, and the Americas. European ships, mostly British by Phyllis Wheatley's lifetime, sailed to the west coast of Africa with guns, ammunition, and other goods, which they exchanged for African men, women, and children, frequently captured and sold by enemy tribes. Europeans were all too willing to accept the enslaved Africans as human cargo, perceived as inexpensive and expendable labor force necessary for the British economy. The slaves would be sold in European colonies, particularly the West Indies, in exchange for sugar and tobacco. It has been estimated that of the 12 million Africans enslaved and forced to migrate to the Americas between 1492 and 1870, about one million died before even leaving the African coast due to the poor conditions of holding stations, factories, and the other abuse, disease, and exhaustion they faced there. Another one million were estimated to have died during the transatlantic journey. We have eyewitness doctor's accounts of the blood and feces that collected on the floors of the slave's deck from the dysentery that would ravage the hold. We have artifacts of the chains that cramped the neck, arms, and legs of slaves. We have the autobiography of Alauda Equiano, who describes the stench of the hold, quarters so cramped that one could hardly turn, the shrieks of abused women, groans of the dying, and children falling into tubs that were used as latrines, almost suffocating in feces. The journey could take anywhere from three weeks to two months, normally six to eight weeks, depending on the weather. Of those who made it to the plantations in the West Indi Indies, as many as a third were estimated to have died during the seasoning period, the first few months where the slaves were expected to acclimate to their new environment, new diseases, new labor conditions. <clears throat> 
Phyllis Wheatley did not tell us any details about her own passage. Perhaps in her trauma, she did not remember much. From letters available at the Medford Historical Society in Massachusetts, we know that the ship that brought her to America was lighter and smaller, American-owned, and not one of the larger European ships associated with some of the most horrific accounts of the transatlantic slave trade. Timothy Fitch, the owner of the brig that would bring Phyllis to America, directed his ship's commander to purchase 100 or 110 prime slaves from the region that now includes Senegal and Gambia. We also know that the trip was made as something of a lull, as something of a lull in the slave trade in the North American colonies due to the Seven Years' War, and was perhaps the only shipment of enslaved Africans to arrive in Boston in 1761. The entire voyage was a disappointment to its owner. Round trip, it took 240 days, and only 75 of the 96 enslaved Africans on board survived the journey. Almost one in four died in the voyage. We have letters from the ship's owner commanding the captain to buy mostly young men and to avoid women and children, not because he was humane, but because they were less economically profitable. The fact that Phyllis was aboard may have been an indicator of the voyage's relative failure for him. Small and fragile, this little girl was called a refuse slave, inexpensive, not considered very valuable. How frightened the naked girl must have been. Would she have been relieved or further terrified when the brig finally landed in Boston? The town had a little over 15,000 people in it at the time. About 800 were of African descent. Of these, about 20 were not slaves. An ad went up in the Boston Gazette, July 13th, 1761. Slaves were for sale. The ship Phyllis had just arrived. We don't know whether the young girl who became Phyllis Wheatley was purchased aboard the anchor ship, or as is more likely, she was sold by the broker John Avery later. We do know she was purchased by Susanna and John Wheatley, and named after the ship that carried her through perhaps the most traumatic event of her life. She was to be a household servant to Susanna Wheatley, Ironically, the child's frail condition meant that she would be considered a luxury good, not suitable for hard labor, but an indicator of her owner's disposable income. The Wheatleys were a prominent and wealthy Bostonian family living in a fashionable part of town. John Wheatley was a tailor, and his clientele included John Hancock. He was also a merchant, a line of work that his son followed. John and Susanna had 18-year-old twins when Phyllis joined their household. Nathaniel and Mary were not the only children, however. Three had died before reaching adulthood. John, Susanna, and the youngest of the family, Sarah. Little Sarah's gravestone was so precise in recording her age that she was probably a favorite child. She died May 11, 1752, aged seven years, nine months, and 18 days. Phyllis Wheatley's biographer, Vincent Coretta, speculates that Mrs. Wheatley was drawn to Phyllis because she was the same age as her beloved child, Sarah, at the time of her death. Whatever the reason, from the accounts we have, an extraordinary relationship developed between Susanna Wheatley and her slave, the young Phyllis. According to Margareta Matilda O'Dell, a great-grandniece of Susanna Wheatley and Phyllis's 19th century biographer, Phyllis had a child's place in the Wheatley's house and in their hearts. There is evidence that Phyllis was indeed treated like a family member rather than a servant or a slave. She was probably not assigned sleeping quarters in an unheated attic like many New England slaves. She may have had space in a hallway or in her own private quarters. She was given light domestic chores Tours which may have given her initial access to conversations in the home between the Wheatleys and their distinguished guests. Among these was the great transatlantic Methodist preacher of the Great Awakening, George Whitfield. Unlike some members of slave societies who feared their slaves converted uh, to Christianity, thinking that it might cause the slaves to grow into an understanding of their dignity as human persons, 
and develop a stronger taste for freedom. The Wheatley family took efforts to educate little Phyllis in the Christian faith. Susanna Wheatley was an active Christian, welcoming visiting Presbyterian and Methodist ministers into her home when they preached in Boston. Whitfield was the most famous of these. Known for his powerful sermons and great oratorical powers, uh, even Ben Franklin recounts his skepticism and curiosity when he went to over here to hear Whitfield. He recounts that in his autobiography. What begins for Franklin as an experiment to see how many people Whitfield could reach with his booming, unamplified voice ends up as a moment where Franklin's heart is touched and his pocket is lightened as Whitfield convinces him to give money to the evangelical cause. Whitfield did not take a stand against slavery as an institution, but he did speak out against cruelty towards slaves and against the idea that Christianity made slaves worse. The Wheatley family shared Christianity with Phyllis, and Phyllis was ultimately baptized into the Christian faith on August 18th, 1771, in the Old South Congregationalist Church. The family attended New South. Old South, though, permitted the baptism of children whose parents were not full members of the church in accordance with the halfway covenant. And in the 1760s, it was the church most sympathetic to Whitfield's evangelical Methodism. Phyllis Wheatley then benefited from a period of religious revival that emphasized personal study of the Bible and thus the prerequisite literacy. In a letter to John Thornton, Phyllis Wheatley writes, I thank you for recommending the Bible to be my chief study. I find and acknowledge it the best of books. It contains an endless treasure of wisdom and knowledge. Basic literacy was common in Boston, although those who could read could not always write, and the education of women was not always prioritized, and the education of Africans rarely encouraged. Phyllis, however, was extraordinary. John Wheatley describes Phyllis's education this way. Without any assistance from school education, and by only what she was taught in the family, she, in 16 months' time from her arrival, attained the English language, to which she was an utter stranger before, to such a degree as to read any, the most difficult parts of the sacred writings, to the great astonishment of all who heard her. And John Wheatley continues, as to her writing, her own curiosity led her to it, and this she learned in so short a time that in the year 1765, she wrote a letter to the Reverend Mr. Ockham, the Indian minister, while in England. This letter is missing. She has a great inclination, John Wheatley continues, to learn the Latin tongue and has made some progress in it. Dr. Steve Jones would be so proud. Phyllis was taught primarily by Mary Wheatley and sometimes by Nathaniel. She soon could read and discuss the Bible, history, Aristotle, Thucydides. She was especially drawn to poetry, to translations of Homer, and to Virgil's epics, and to the English poets John Milton and Alexander Pope, especially. She was given access to a dictionary and a place and time to write. As we have seen, her first poems were elegies, Funeral elegies were popular poems to write at the time, and they were not considered the stuff of highbrow literature. Benjamin Franklin, for one, made fun of the elegy form and of the trend of writing elegies, although in his autobiography he admits his own early attempt at writing one. The elegies that Wheatley wrote were presented as consolation for the bereaved family members. Sad to say, many of these poems captured the grief of a parent losing a young child a reminder of terrible infant and child mortality rates. And by one estimate, the average lifespan was 26 years old, while the median age of death throughout colonial New England was 11.2 years. In Wheatley's elegies, she also wrote about faith, the primary consolation for her in the midst of sorrow. She would send copies of her poems to the survivors of the deceased, 
Susanna Wheatley arranged to have her poems published in the Boston Gazette. Phyllis was a child prodigy and a protege, and she was beginning to receive public notice. While these poems convey a piety, a modesty, and a humility of spirit that would have been quite acceptable among the 18th century Bostonian readers, today they are more controversial, partly due to their very modesty. Her most famous poem, for example, um, in some circles her most notorious poem, is on being brought from Africa to America, and it has sparked much debate. It's short, I'll read it to you. Twas mercy brought me from my pagan land, taught my benighted soul to understand there's a God, that there's a savior too. Once I redemption neither sought nor knew. Some view our sable race with scornful eye, their color is a diabolic dye. Remember, Christians, Negroes black as cane may be refined and join the angelic train. On one hand, Phyllis could not have thought that the owner or the commander of the slave ship that transported her to the Americas was acting out of mercy. No, this mercy was divine. To Phyllis, the mercy was God's, working behind the scenes in her moments of greatest agony and suffering, fear, or humiliation, leading her to a life where she was a slave, let's not forget that, but she was also given the message of Christ, which delivered her from spiritual bondage. At least that's how she understood it. In her correspondence with her only known African-American female friend, Obor Tanner, Phyllis Wheatley frequently remarks on her understanding of God's providence at work in her life through a reception of the gospel message of Christ's love. Such expressions of gratitude to Christ and by implication to the Wheatley family who introduced Christ to her are often unpalatable to contemporary scholars of African-American literature, sometimes to the extent that especially in the 1960s and 70s, Phyllis Wheatley is ridiculed by some for not being black enough, for being out of touch with the oppression suffered by the African-American community, and for writing poems that imitated the style and literary heritage of the society that enslaved her. This can be a tense and difficult matter to consider, so allow me to pause here for an observation. At HBU, we talk about the intersection of Athens, understood as the best ideas of the pagan world, and Jerusalem, understood as the essentials and traditions surrounding our Christian faith. Within this understanding of Athens and Jerusalem is the idea that all truth is God's truth, that a person can learn the important contributions made by cultures outside of one's own faith community, and that we can be intellectually and spiritually strengthened by exercising our minds and appreciating the best that culture can offer. Phyllis Wheatley's conversion to Christianity and her quick intelligence and desire to learn made her eager to absorb information, ideas, and the literary heritage that the Wheatley family were able to share with her. She was genuinely grateful for the opportunity she had, and she developed extraordinary bonds with the Wheatley family Yes, there were also the bonds of slavery. There were also bonds of gratitude and love. And Phyllis was eager to soak up whatever was good, true, and beautiful that she could find, even in the society that enslaved her. Now, personally, I'm impatient of any pro-slavery argument that rests its case on how well a slave is treated. Slavery itself, the idea that one human being can be the chattel or property of another, is dehumanizing. A gilded cage is still a cage. But while Phyllis may have disappointed or disgusted many in the African-American scholarly and arts communities for her supposed contentment with that cage, her writing reveals a quiet and yet persistent defense of liberty. She, like many others, noticed the hypocrisy of the colonists clamoring for liberty and using the metaphors of slavery to describe their relationship with England while they were all too willing to participate in or tacitly condone the very real slavery of transported Africans in their midst. The louder voices include Samuel Johnson, who in Taxation No Tyranny bl bluntly wrote 
How is it that we hear that the loudest yelps for liberty are among the drivers of Negroes? Phyllis Wheatley's response was much gentler than that of some others. But if we are quiet before her, we can hear it in her poems. This is seen, for example, in her poem to the Earl of Dartmouth upon his recent appointment to the position of Secretary of State for British holdings in the New World. Wheatley greatly hopes that Dartmouth's influence in this new position would correct some of the abuses the colonists faced from their mother country. In justifying her right to consider the topic, she refers to her own kidnapping and involuntary transportation. Here's an excerpt from the poem. No more, America, in mournful strain of wrongs and grievance unredressed complain. No longer shall thou dread the iron chain which wanton tyranny with lawless hand had made and with it meant to enslave the land. Should you, my lord, while you peruse my song, wonder from whence my love of freedom sprung, whence flow these wishes for the common good by feeling hearts alone best understood? I, young in life, by seeming cruel fate, was snatched from Afric's fancied happy seat. What pangs excruciating must molest, what sorrows labor in my parents' breast. Steeled was that soul, and by no misery moved that from a father seized his babe beloved. Such, such my case, and can I then but pray others may never feel tyrannic sway? In a letter to the Reverend Samson Ockham, a Native American who became a Presbyterian missionary and stayed at the Wheatley home while in Boston, Phyllis Wheatley speaks out in prose. She mentions the natural rights of black people and how important it is for civil and religious liberty to operate together and how regardless of the relatively comfortable circumstances of the enslaved, true contentment is impossible without freedom. She compares the status of enslaved African Americans to that of the Israelites in bondage in Egypt. And I quote, In every human breast, God has implanted a principle which we call love of freedom. It is impatient of oppression and pants for deliverance. And by the leave of our modern Egyptians, I will assert that the same principle lives in us. God grant deliverance in his own way and time and get him honor upon all those whose avarice impels them to countenance and help forward the calamities of their fellow creatures. This I desire not for their hurt, but to convince them of the strange absurdity of their conduct whose words and actions are so diametrically opposite how well the cry for liberty and the reverse disposition for the exercise of oppressive power over others agree, I humbly think it does not require the penetration of a philosopher to determine. Phyllis Wheatley's weapon was her pen, but she used it gracefully. She became famous due to her elegy on George Whitfield, who died in 1770. She sent a copy to Selina Hastings, the Countess of Huntington, who was also the patroness of George Whitfield. By 1772, Phyllis had written enough poems that she and the Wheatleys made plans to publish them collected in a single volume. Attempts to publish in Boston were unsuccessful. She couldn't acquire enough subscribers that agreed to purchase her a copy of poems if it were brought into print, and so she turned to England. The Countess of Huntington agreed that if Phyllis Wheatley could find a publisher for a book of her poems, she would lend her name as the dedicatee. The Countess also asked that an engraving of Phyllis Wheatley uh, would be included in that volume. Uh, that is the engraving that appears on the flyers for this event. It was completed by the African painter Scipio Moorhead. The Wheatleys soon found a publisher in London who agreed to publish Wheatley's poems, but on one condition. Archibald Bell, bookseller, would put together a volume only if some distinguished men of Boston, white men, would sign a formal attestation, a declaration that the poems claimed to be written by this young black woman were indeed written by her. <laughs> 
We don't know how the Wheatley family made arrangements for this hurdle to be met, but indeed it was. The making of the document is dramatized by a play, The Trial of Phyllis Wheatley, and I recommend it to your consideration if any of you are thespians, maybe consider performing it next year. Were the 18 men that signed that paper assembled in one room when they were considering the intellectual and poetic capacity of this African-American slave? The men included loyalists and patriots. Uh, tension was thick on the eve of the revolution. They included Thomas Hutchinson, the governor of Massachusetts, Andrew Oliver, the lieutenant governor, Reverend Samuel Mather, Cotton Mather's son, and John Hancock. They agreed. They attested to Phyllis Wheatley's mental powers. And they signed this statement. We whose names are underwritten do assure the world that the poems specified in the following page Whereas we verily believe written by Phyllis, a young Negro girl who was but a few years since brought an uncultivated barbarian from Africa and has ever since been and now is under the disadvantage of serving as a slave in the family of this town. She has been examined by some of the best judges and thought qualified to write them. In the summer of 1773, Phyllis Wheatley, um, sick, frail and hoping to improve her health, as well as to promote the publication of her volume of poetry, traveled with Nathaniel Wheatley to England. There she met Ben Franklin. She tried to meet the ha Countess of Huntington, um, who is gone in Wales, and we have letters where um, their regrets are expressed at that missed meeting. She had a tour of some of the sites of London, and that included the tower. And the tour guide that she had was Granville Sharp. He was a very important campaigner for the abolition of the slave trade. His greatest success was the Somerset case, or also called the Mansfield ruling. James Somerset was an African slave that was brought by his master to England and ran away. Uh, he escaped his master, but was later caught and forced onto a slave ship bound for Jamaica. Uh, men on his behalf asked for a writ of habeas corpus to bring Somerset before the court and to determine whether or not it were possible or legal even to force a man who once was a slave back into slavery on, from English soil. Lord Mansfield ruled that the English law did not permit the forcible sending of someone overseas into bondage, that a slave becomes free the moment that he sets foot on English territory. This was one of the most significant achievements in the campaign to abolish slavery throughout the world. It was an early one. Uh, it did not do as much as what people thought that it did, but it was celebrated especially in the uh, African-American and Afro-Britain community as uh, almost an emancipation proclamation. This was in 1772, and Granville Sharp was a year out of that success when he was showing Phyllis Wheatley uh, just the caged animals and the crown jewels in the Tower of London. We don't have records of a conversation that Granville Sharp and Phyllis Wheatley might have had at that moment, but we can only speculate that Phyllis Wheatley knew that she had an option. Once she was in England, she didn't have to return. She could free herself by staying. If she didn't know through Granville Sharp, which is, to my mind, unlikely, she could have known through the Boston newspapers that published this decision and considered the results of it for American slave owners and the dangers of bringing their slaves to America. Notices about the Somerset case and the Mansfield ruling were in the same periodicals and newspapers that Phyllis Wheatley published her own poems in. 
And then Susanna Wheatley fell ill. And Phyllis was essentially at a fork in the road. She most likely knew that she could have been free if she stayed, but she decided to return with Nathaniel Wheatley to attend her sick mistress. There's a possibility that Phyllis Wheatley was um, savvy and decided to use this situation and the cards in her favor in order to extract from Nathaniel Wheatley a promise of manumission or of freedom at her return. At any rate, a month after she returned, on September 13th, 1773, by October 18th, Phyllis Wheatley was granted her freedom. She was very excited by the American Revolution. Um, not without mixed feelings, though. She had friends who were loyalist. She also was excited about the cause of liberty. When she heard that George Washington was the leader of the Patriot forces, she wrote a poem praising him, and it's filled with anticipation and excitement about what a possible new nation would have in store. To Washington, she said, Proceed, great chief, with virtue on thy side. Thy every action let the goddess guide. A crown, a mansion, and a throne that shine with golden fading Washington be thine. She sent the poem in a letter to George Washington, who was delayed in war from answering her letter, but eventually did inviting her to visit him if she had the opportunity. We don't know whether or not she actually had uh, the possibility of taking that opportunity. We do know that she continued to correspond with friends, um, both in America and in England. John Paul Jones, the Re American Revolutionary Naval Commander, reputed to have said, I have not yet begun to fight, and refusing to back down to British ships, initiated a correspondence with Wheatley, sending her a poem, perhaps hoping that she would send one in return. Voltaire pointed to Phyllis Wheatley as proof of the humanity and intellect of the African American, the African in general. Reviewers of her work of poetry esteemed her, praised her, and she became an international celebrity. Thomas Jefferson had questions, though. I wish I could say that Phyllis Wheatley's manumission, that her freedom, let her soar, let her take off. The fact is that economic depression and war made it difficult for Wheatley to sell her books and then to gather enough support for a second volume of poetry on which she hoped to live. She did work as a hotel. She married a free black man named John Peters. He had a reputation for being very litigious and conceited. The allegation of conceit may have been blown out of proportion, and the effect of prejudice against a free black man who wore a wig and carried a cane. Or it may have been indicative of a certain selfishness and um, pretentiousness that ultimately drove Wheatley and her husband to poverty. She tried to sell subscriptions to a second volume of poems under the name of Phyllis Peters, and she may have lost the financial support of those who knew her only as Phyllis Wheatley. John Peters likely had influence in setting the price of her second volume, which was exorbitantly high, even when you consider the cost of um, inflation. Phyllis Wheatley and John Peters had three children. They, were all, they all died young. The poet who had been so familiar with death from the 25% of Africans who did not survive the transatlantic voyage to the heart-wrenching cries of mourning parents that she captured in her elegies to the death of Christopher Snyder, the 11-year-old boy who was killed when a loyalist shot into a crowd of patriots that were attacking his home and considered the first casualty of the American Revolution. 
to the loss of a great evangelical preacher who swept England and the colonies into a spiritual great awakening. Phyllis Wheatley's last experiences with death were the most intimate ones of all. She died December 5, 1784. Her baby died soon after so that mother and child would be buried together in an unmarked grave. Her husband, John Peters, was in prison for debt. I'd like to share some words from Henry Louis Gates, Jr., who is professor and director of the Hutchins Center for African and African American Research at Harvard University, and the first African American scholar to be awarded the National Humanities Medal. In his biography of Phyllis Wheatley, which is also wrestling with and honoring Thomas Jefferson. He said, too black to be taken seriously by white critics in the 18th century. Wheatley is now considered too white to interest black critics in the 20th. The critics of the black arts movement and after were convening their own interrogation squad and they were a rather more hostile group than met that day in 1772. Haunting questions of identity Linger with us still, Professor Gates wrote in 2002. He then shares a poll where the charge of acting white was applied to speaking standard English, getting straight A's, or even visiting the Smithsonian. He writes, think about it. We have moved from a situation where Phyllis Wheatley's acts of literacy could be used to demonstrate our people's inherent humanity and their inalienable right to freedom to a situation where acts of literacy are stigmatized as acts of racial betrayal. Phyllis Wheatley, so proud to the end of her hard-won achievements, would weep. So would Frederick Douglass. So would W.E.B. Du Bois. Professor Gates' conclusion is stirring, compelling to us all. He asks us to cast aside the mine and thine rhetoric of cultural ownership. For cultures can no more be owned than people can. This is the vision we must embrace, he says, as full and equal citizens of the Republic of Letters, whose citizenry must always embrace both Phyllis Wheatley and Thomas Jefferson. There are no white minds or black minds, he continues. There are only minds. The challenge isn't to read white or to read black. It is to read. If Wheatley stood for anything, it was the creed that culture was, and could be the equal possession of all humanity. In a letter to John Adams, uh, I'm sorry, in a letter that John Adams wrote to his wife Abigail Adams from Paris, dated May 1780, Adams briefly lists the cultural sites that he has taken in, wishing that he had time to describe them in greater detail for her. He explains his opinion that America is not yet in a place where the pinnacle of its citizens' contributions would be artistic. He writes, I could feel, fill volumes with descriptions of temples and palaces, paintings, sculptures, tapestry, porcelain, etc., 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 if I could have time. But I could not do this without neglecting my duty. The science of government, it is my duty to study, more than all other sciences. The arts of legislation and administration and negotiation ought to take the place of, and indeed exclude in a manner, all other arts. I must study politics and war, that our sons may have liberty to study mathematics and philosophy. Our sons ought to study mathematics and philosophy, geography, natural history, and naval architecture, navigation, commerce, and agriculture, in order to give their children a right to study painting, poetry, music, architecture, statuary, tapestry, and porcelain. It might be tempting to think of Phyllis Wheatley as a Forrest Gump, a character whose life intersects with some of the greatest minds, men, most significant events of her time and place. Her path crosses such dignitaries as John Hancock, Ben Franklin, George Washington, John Paul Jones, and Thomas Jefferson. 
In England, her associations included the Earl of Dartmouth, the Countess of Huntington, and leading abolitionists like Granville Sharp. She was known and esteemed by other extraordinary African Americans and Afro Britons, such as Alauda Equiano, Jupiter Hammond, and Ignatius Sancho. Phyllis Wheatley deserves to be celebrated in her own right, and I don't want to detract from celebration of her mind, her imagination, her poetic talent, her generosity and strength of spirit, her ingenuity, her resilience, her endurance. She wasn't an abolitionist poet, but she was a strong example of the full personhood and rich potential of black men and women at a time and place where, to the shame of the human race, the personhood and potential of black people had been severely ignored to the effect that they were abused, belittled, commodified, and enslaved. We still have work to do to combat racially motivated hatred, belittlement, and destruction with love, courage, knowledge, and creative output. I do think that we can benefit from thinking long and hard about sectors of our society where we rationalize poor treatment of others, especially those whose personhood and potential are not recognized or protected by our laws. I do think we have a lot of work to do. And if you want to find the places where we need work, and I would add prayer, I don't think they're hard to find. But Phyllis Wheatley was a peacemaker. And her last poem, Liberty and Peace, celebrating the conclusion of the Revolutionary War is an example of that. It even includes hope that England and the new country that is hers, at least in one sense, might find peace together. Here's a short excerpt of it. For now, kind heaven, indulgent to our prayer, in smiling peace, resolves the din of war, fixed in Columbia her illustrious line, and bids in thee her future counsels shine. To every realm, her portals open wide, receives from each the full commercial tide. Each art and science, now with rising charms, the expanding heart with emulation warms. And even Great Britannia sees with dread surprise, and from the da dazzling splendor turns her eyes. Britain, whose natives swept the Atlantic o'er, and thunder sent to every distant shore, even thou, in manners cruel as thou art, the sword resigned, resume the friendly part. I pray that we all have the peacemaking skills, the courage, the strength, the virtue, and the resolve of Phyllis Wheatley. Thank you.